Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my lesson. My name is International Master Robert Gwaze, and uh, for today's lesson, um, we are going to be talking about uh, positional judgment. You know, uh, most of my students always ask me this question. How can one uh, really improve chess? I mean, we have tried all sorts of things. We've looked at tactics and openings, end games, but how does one really improve? Now, there is no one formula for success. I think most of it stems from hard work uh, and zeal. Uh, but uh, for today's lesson, I'm going to try my best um, to, to help you get to a point where you really understand chess, not just memorize stuff, but uh, I would like to attempt to teach you to truly, really, really understand uh, the things that will be going on on the chessboard. Uh, this is why I came up with this uh, a lesson today, Positional Judgment. All right. So before we begin, or before I can start to show you some um, studies, some positions, I'm just going to take you through step by step, very slowly. All right. So the first thing is um, in chess, only the attacker wins. In chess, only the attacker wins. Now, what do I mean? I mean to say... Even if you were to be a queen up or a rook up, at some point in the game, for you to win it, you're going to have to attack. You're going to have to do something to make a checkmate. That's basically what I mean when I say in chess, only the attacker wins. Now, who is supposed to attack? White or black? The answer is simple. Just like in soccer. The team with the ball is the team that attacks. Likewise in chess, the person with the advantage is the one who is supposed to attack. Not only is he supposed to attack, it's his duty. If he does not do that, he risks losing the advantage. All right? I'll say that again. The person with the advantage is has got the duty to attack otherwise they risk losing the advantage and the person with the disadvantage must try to defend the position if they do attack they will be risking worsening their position all right so the person with the disadvantage must try to improve their position only when their position is good will they be able to attack so how can you tell if somebody is having the advantage or the disadvantage? That's how we come to this topic now, positional judgment. You should be able to judge the position, to assess the position, to evaluate it, and come up with the right evaluation of the position. Okay, I hope you're with me for now. So I'm going to show you a quick example. Okay, let's just uh, play maybe the um, Ray Lopez position. Okay. Okay, I just chose to play this. I had not prepared for this uh, opening. I just chose to play it because it's very uh, simple to understand. I'm um, sorry, let's turn this. It is the next turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is all standard moves of the Rui Lopez. Then we have c5, d4, queen c7. Let's just say white plays these, and maybe here, uh, let's just say maybe this. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so let's uh, take a look at this position just as a study, all right, just as an example. Now, if I may ask you, in this position, whom do you think has the advantage? Whom do you think should be attacking? And whom do you think should be the one defending? 
All right, so let's assess the position together. All right, so before we start, I'm going to um, mention to you these three things. I know it's not gonna make sense now, but it will very soon. We have three types of advantages in chess. Three types of advantages in chess. The first type of an advantage, uh, we call it slight advantage or small advantage. It basically means you have an advantage, but it's not enough to win the game. That is slight advantage. Slight advantage is one point to five points. Anything ranging from one point to five points. Don't worry about it, it will make sense very soon. The second type of an advantage that we have is called clear advantage. Now, clear advantage means we can all see that one is having an advantage and if they are to play accurately, they should be able to win the game. So in other words, clear advantage is winning provided you play accurately. And the clear advantage is anything ranging from six to 10 points, six to 10 points. Then the last step of an advantage, we call it decisive advantage. This is when it's really obvious, you know, that one player is winning. You know, for example, a person is a queen up. Now that is very clear that the guy who's a queen up is winning the game. Now, decisive advantage is anything from 11 points upwards. Anything from 11 points. All right. So let us look at this position now and go slowly and assess it and see what, uh, who is having the advantage and what type of an advantage they're having. Now, how can you tell if somebody is having an advantage? You look at the weaknesses of the player or in the player's position. The first type of weakness we are going to look at is called uh, doubled pawns. Now, we all know what double pawns look like. Um, I think most of us do know uh, how double pawns look like. For instance, um, maybe I should just try to create a double pawn here for you. Okay, so like these two pawns here, that's what we call double pawns. And in most cases, the double pawns are considered to be a weakness. Okay, I actually call double pawns, I actually say double pawns are as good as one. All right, because with one pawn, you can actually stop both of them from moving forward. All right, so this is how double pawns look like. Let's just go back. Now, how many double pawns do we have for white and how many double pawns do we have for black? Maybe before we can proceed, what I would like you, what I would like to ask you to do is maybe grab a sheet of paper and on a sheet of paper, um, write a W, a plain sheet of paper, write a big W on the left side. And on the far right side, you can put a B. So a W is for white, and the B is for, for black. Okay, let me do this also here. All right, so we have a W for, a w for white and a B for black. And put a line in between them, a long line between them. All right, so we are going to look at the doubled pawns. How many doubled pawns does white have? I don't see any doubled pawns for white, neither do I see for black. So what are we going to write on the sheet? Under W, okay, so under white we are going to write zero, double pawns and black zero so so far it's zero zero which means if we were going 
to judge this position according to doubled pawns, this position we would consider it equal. If we were just going to judge it according to doubled pawns, this position would be equal. The next type of a weakness that we need want to look at is um, isolated pawns. Now, what are isolated pawns? These are pawns without neighbors. What do I mean pawns without neighbors? Now, A is a neighbor to B. So we see a neighbor to D going all the way to H. Which means a pawn on A is a neighbor to a pawn on B. It's a neighbor pawn on C, a neighbor to a pawn on D. So any pawn that does not have a neighbor, that pawn is considered isolated. Isolated pawn is a pawn that cannot be protected by another pawn because it does not have a neighbor. Let me just try to create quickly an isolated pawn. So let's say here. Now, if you can see clearly, you see that white has just created an isolated pawn the one on B, because, uh, the one on A, sorry. The pawn on A2 does not have any neighbor in the B file, which makes it isolated and vulnerable. But the pawn on C, yes, it might look weak. It actually is kind of weak, but it's not an isolated pawn because it has a neighbor, still has a neighbor. You never know, maybe one day it will make it all the way to C6. So it still does have a neighbor. I hope it's making sense. All right, so that's how an isolated pawn um, looks like. So how many isolated pawns um, do we have for white? I see none. Black, zero. So what do we write on the sheet of the paper? We're going to write zero isolated pawns for white. And on black side, we're also going to put a zero. So again, if we were going to judge this position according to doubled pawns and isolated pawns, this position would be equal. Right. The third type of uh, weakness that we are going to look at is called pawn islands. Now, what are pawn islands? Pawn islands are a group of pawns connected. So it's like a pawn chain. It's a group of pawns connected. It's, a, it's neighbors, pawn neighbors. For instance, all these are neighbors. All these pawns are neighbors. Can you see? Now, you, must, you might be asking how. It's because, remember, we, we established already that Pawn on A is a neighbor to B, pawn on C is a neighbor to D, and pawn on E is a neighbor to F. All right. Even though at the moment, pawn on E and a pawn on F might look like they are not connected, but in the future, they can always connect. For instance, look at this. Black is to play pawn, maybe knight. These pawns are already connected. Is that making sense? All right. So what are pawn islands? Pawn islands is a group of pawns connected. It's neighbors. So how many pawn islands do we have for white? We have one. Why? Because all the pawns are neighbors. Black also, all the pawns are neighbors. All right. But let me just give an example. Now, uh, maybe here. Now, just take a quick look at this. How many pawn islands do you see for white? Yes, your answer is as, is as good as mine. It's one for white. Why? Because B is connected to C and C connected to D, all the way to H. But for black, there is a gap here. There is nothing in the B file 
which means black has got two pawn islands. The pawn on a5 is an island on its own, and all these other are connected. They're all neighbors, which means black has got two pawn islands, whereas white has got only one. So if we were going to judge the position according to the pawn islands here, white would be better. So let's go back to our study position. So in terms of pawn islands, again, it's equal. White is one, black is one pawn island. So if you want, you could actually write one island for white and one island for black. Oh, we could just keep it simple and just write a zero, zero, since it's equal. We don't want to keep too many numbers. So let's just go zero pawn islands and zero for black. So zero for white and zero for black. So, so far the position seems to be equal. Let's keep going. So now we move on to the one of the most sensitive weaknesses in chess. This you need to master. We call this weak squares. Okay, hear me right. Weak squares, not weak pawns, but weak squares. Now, what are weak squares? Weak squares are squares that cannot be prevented by a pawn. Yes, you might be able to attack them using a big piece, a major or minor piece. You might be able to attack that square using a bishop, a knight, a rook, or a king. But you cannot attack this square using a pawn. That's what we call weak squares. Let me just give you an example. So, let's say one day black was to play, um, let's say white. So let's say white plays knight to h4. They want to move their knight to f5. Now, would you call the square on f5 a weak square? Now remember, 1 to 4, number 1 to 4 ranks is white side. All right, and five to eight is black's half. So any problems that we have from number one to number four are white's problems. Five to eight, those are black's issues. So in this case, look at the f5 square. Would you call that a weak square? If my knight was to be placed there, so let's just say maybe uh, rook. If my knight was to be placed on f5, can black chase it away using a pawn? Yes, they can, which means uh, the f5 square is not a weak square because it can actually be prevented by a pawn. All right, let's just go back one move. All right, in some cases, in some instances, you could have even played g6 to prevent knight from coming to f5, which means f5 is not a weak square. Are you getting it? All right, so let us look at uh, the number of weak squares that white has and the number of weaknesses, weak squares, sorry, that black has. Now, when you're looking for weak squares for white, you check in the rank number three. So you find the weak squares in this rank and that one. And for black, you find them number five and number six. Why is that? Because we can not have a weak square, for instance, here. Oh, sorry, I did not mean to move it. For example, here. Why? Because we do not have pawns on the 8th rank to prevent uh, a piece occupying that square. So this line does not count for weak squares. Only line number 5 and, sorry, 6 and 5. Okay, so how many weak squares does white have? Let us work together. Let's start from a3. Is this a weak square? If black was to occupy the pawn on a3, I mean the, the square on a3, would white be able to capture something with their pawn or would they be able to attack that piece with their pawn? Yes, 
white as a pawn that could easily capture, which means this a3 is not a weak square. What about pawn on a square on b3? Again, b3 is not a weak square because of the pawn there. c3, c3 cannot be a weak square because there's already a pawn occupying it, unless you're going to call it a weak pawn. Then I might, I might understand where you're coming from, but we cannot call it a weak square because there's already a pawn occupying that place. So that doesn't count. Okay. What about the pawn on d3? If black was to play knight, and maybe one day occupy the square with the knight like that, would white be able to capture the knight using a pawn? No, white does not have a pawn there. Neither does he have a pawn on c2, which makes d3 a weak square. Are you getting it? All right, so, so, so far we have found one weak square, which is d3. All right, let's keep going. Now, what about e3? Is e3 a weak square? Nope. Pawn on f2 to capture that. Is f3 a weak square? Yes, there is a big piece, so it's, it's, there's a possibility that it might actually be a weak square. If a square is occupied by a big piece, it can still count as a weak square. But in this case, um, f3 is not because we have a pawn on g2. All right, g3 is not a weak square because we have a pawn on f2. s3 cannot count as a weak square because there is a pawn occupying it. So line number three, we only see one weak square. For white. Now let's move on to line number four. I'm going to give you a few seconds just to look at it and then maybe you can work it out and try to come up with how many weak squares you see um, here. Okay. Now how many weaknesses did you come up with? I see zero. Let's start from a4. If black was to occupy a4, white could easily attack that piece on a4 with pawn to b3, which makes a4 not a weak square. All right, b4 is not a weak square also because of the pawn on c3. Okay, pawn um, square on d4 is not a weak square. Why? That captures. E4 cannot be a weak square because it's already occupied by the pawn. And we move to um, square on F4 now. I want you to really take a good look at F4. Is F4 a weak square or not? I bet you thought it was a weak square. Actually, it's not. Why? Because if black was to occupy the f4 square with the big piece. All right. So let's just say um, maybe here. If black was to occupy the weak square, white would be able to chase it away. So which means f4 is not a weak square, even though it looks like a weak square uh, right now. But it's not a weak square because in the future, white could actually move the knight and, and, and threaten it with pawn to g3. I hope it makes sense. So g4 is not a weak square because of the pawn on h3, sorry, to capture there. h4 not a weak square because potentially in the future, white might be able to push the pawn to attack the h4. Which means in total, white is only one weak square on d3. Now let us quickly look at the black now that you understand what weak squares are. Let's just go fast on the black side. Let's begin with a line number six. Whoop. How many weak squares do you see? Now I see two. c6 and b6. That's not a weak square. All these are not weak squares. 
but this one on C6 is a weak square. C6 and B6 are both weak squares. So, so far black has two. Let us move to uh, line number five, okay, the fifth rank. Starting here, is this a weak square or not? No, it's not, because if white is to occupy there, it can easily get attacked by the pawn on G6. What about G5? Also not a weak square because of the pawn on A6, F5. We've already looked at F5. That's not a weak square. And here we have some pawns. C5. This pawn could capture. So C5 is not a weak square. B5, there is a pawn. A5 is another weak square. So how many weak squares do we have here? Just one, two, and three. A black compared to white, one. So for weak square, this is what you do. White has got one weak square, black has three, which means in terms of weak squares, white is better by two. All right, white is leading by two. So what do you write? You simply write two points for white under the weak squares, two points, and you give black zero. You do this only for weak squares. That's where you actually put uh, the difference. But for all the other ones, as you shall see, you only give one point. All right, so once we've done this, we go to what I would like to call piece for piece. Now, what is piece for piece? This is when you get to um, compare the pieces to see which ones are better placed. All right. For instance, this rook on a1, you will have to compare it with the rook on a8 because they're both from the a file to see which one is better. So let's dive right into it. Which one is better, a1 rook or the a8 rook? All right, so just make sure to write piece for piece on your sheet of paper and First thing, I want you to write rooks. So you could actually write A1 and A8. So you know which rooks you are comparing. Now, which rook is better? It's easy to see. White has got only one square to move to, but look at blacks. Black could move to one, two, three, four, five. So let's be honest. Black's A rook is better than white's A rook. What do you do? You give one to black, zero for white. Okay, for all these other um, weaknesses, you only award one point. All right, so we're done with that one. Let's look at the other set of rooks, the one on E1, okay, which originally belonged to H1, I guess the one on F8, which was on H8. Which one is better? So this one is one, two, three places that you can move to. And the black's one has got one, two, three, four. Again, black's rook seems to be better. So what do we do? We write one for black, zero for white. All right. Let's move on to the bishops. The light colored bishop will be compared to the light colored bishop, black's light colored bishop. So let's look at the bishop on c2 versus the bishop on uh, d7. Which one has got more space, more squares to move to? All right, decent squares, I mean. All right, so I can only see one, two. This one I can only see one, which means black's bishop is better. So let's give one for black, zero to white. So you will see that as you get used to this thing, sometimes just by quickly looking like this, you can already tell which one is better, like the next one. The dark colored bishops, just by looking, you can see that black has got only one place to move to. So the moment you just see that white has got already two, you ain't got to finish all the way there. You already know that white is better. So what do we do here? We give one for white, another bishop, zero to black okay let's move to the knights the knight which was on b8 is this one and the one which was on b1 is 
seated right on g3 now. So we're comparing these two knights. Which one is better? Let's start with black. So black has one, two, and three. Now the white one could actually jump to f5. It's possible. Okay. Yes, it can be captured, but that will be an exchange. It's actually a, a, a possibility that they could move it there. So that counts as a decent move. So that's one, two, three, four. We are going to give one to white and zero for black. So let us do that. One, zero for black. Okay. Now the other set of knights, it's the one on f3 versus the one on f6. Which one is better? Okay, it seems like black has got only one decent place to move to. They could not move to h5 because of the uh, knight on g3. So black has got only one square to move to. And white seems to have one, two, three, four. So again, white's knight is better. So let's give one for white, zero for black. Let us now move to the kings. Now, if fire was to break out and uh, the kings was to try and escape, which one has a higher or a better chance of surviving? We see that black has got only one square to run to, but white can actually choose from one two, three, which makes the white king better. So let us give one for white, zero to black. And the last piece we are going to look at is the queen. Which queen is better? Again, as you get used to this way of calculating things become easy, just by looking you will know which one is better. So how many Squares can the white queen move to? I see only two decent places. That's one and two. All right, the queen cannot go to d3. There is a pawn on c4. Neither can it move to d4. That's not good because of the pawn on e5. All right, so which means the queen could actually move to these two places. What about black? Black's queen could move to b6, a5. That's already two places. d8. We ain't got to finish everything else. We already can see that uh, black's queen is uh, better. So let us give one to black, zero for white. All right, so now that we have looked at um, uh, everything in terms of the weaknesses, uh, let us now calculate, let us just look at the total uh, points that we have. All right, so I'm gonna count this here. I have one, two, three, four, Four for black and for, for white I have two, three, four, five, six. For white I have six points. So white has six points, black has four points, which means the overall white is leading by two points only. Okay, so the overall evaluation or the assessment of this position is that white is up by two. Now, what kind of an advantage is two points? Two points is equivalent to a slight advantage. Because remember what I mentioned, slight advantage is one to five points. Okay, anything ranging from one to five points. Clear is 6 to 10, and decisive, anything above 11. Which means if you were to play this game, if you were the one playing with the white pieces and your opponent maybe offers you a draw, it's, it's worth considering um, a draw offer here because it's not like you're winning. Yes, you do have a slight advantage, but it's not enough to win the game. You see, so just by judging the position, you'll be able to make wise decisions. You'll be able to take a draw when you feel like it's drawish. And you'll be able to, to, to refuse draws when you feel like you're having a clear advantage or a decisive advantage. So can you see what uh, positional judgment uh, does? It's a very, very important quality uh, for every chess player. Now that you know you have an advantage as 
what what's next stay tuned in for the second part where i'll show you now what you need to do from this position onwards thank you mm -hmm.